Um, yes, Quinta was very wonderful on the um, Thursday evening. The children uh, came on to the into the, they were really wonderful, weren't they? they were great. I think they were about I can't remember how many. 80 between the ages of uh, six and 10, I think some like 80. And then in the youth, similar numbers. And uh, it, was, it was really wonderful to see their enthusiasm. The children, it was just so inspiring. And the children's workers, their enthusiasm. And uh, wonder I was really jealous of their fit bodies. Uh, <laughs> they were doing all these movements and jumping up and down and running up and anyway. Anyway, I'll, I'll be doing that another year. As you know, I'm working through the Gospel of Luke. And if you remember last time, we looked at the birth of Christ, the appearance to the angels, and then Jesus presented in the temple and Simeon came to bless. And so we're now in chapter two, verse 36 and we're looking at um, two events one is Anna the prophetess and then Jesus <coughs> as a 12 year old we're going to see the these are the two events we're looking at this morning so let's just read verse 36 now there was one Anna a prophetess We don't have her prophecies. I don't think there's any record of her prophecies. But she was a prophetess. Um, I don't know what people think. You know, later on people said, oh, women shouldn't speak in church. Did you? There's a movement called the Brethren Movement. They, women are not allowed to speak. And uh, But she, she was a prophetess. There are many in the Bible. And... Uh, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. So the 12 tribes were still there, but not in large numbers. The 12 tribes did migrate south. The faithful ones migrated south. And the, um, the south of Jerusalem, the southern hill, had to be built up again um, after the division of the kingdoms because of the tribe, those the faithful ones coming south to be in Judah. That's why these people were there. She was of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And the woman was a widow of about 84 years. And the, apparently, I'm not very expert on the Greek, but apparently the Greek is quite difficult here to calculate her age, whether it was that she was widowed for 84 years or whether she was 84 years old if she was widowed for 84 years the earliest age you could marry as a jewess was 12 in those days well <laughs> maybe you're glad that we're in a more <laughs> different age but she may have been there for over a hundred if you count uh, various things if she was a widow for 84 years she'd been married at the age of 12 and married for seven years, you, you do the math, she was over, over 100 years old, possible. But she may have been 84, uh, a young sprightly thing of 84. <clears throat> she did not depart from the temple area. Uh, we don't know what these things mean. Does that mean that every morning she came back from her little room somewhere, maybe with family? Every morning she set off up there to pray. But she served God with fastings and prayers. Don't fast if you're old, you might not live long. Uh, but you see, this woman <laughs> proves the opposite. She fasted and prayed 84 years of age or whatever. And she, she served God night and day. What a woman. And quite uh, sacrificial and quite out of step with the religious idolatry of the age because they idolized the temple, they idolized everything, the, the, the law, they made idols of all these wonderful things that God had given them, 
but she wasn't an idolatrous woman. She was a true worshipper. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of Jesus to all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. What a remarkable woman. When you think that she was widowed at such an early age, she could have been bitter, she could have been angry. Life has a, so many crossroads, but she in her reaction to difficulties in life uh, was to see that God's hand was upon her and she served him. She served him all those many, many years. And uh, that wonderful example of faithfully following the Lord in joy, anticipation of the coming of the Lord, and, uh, uh, but also that she was willing to speak to others. It says that uh, she spoke of him to all those. Wow, she must have gone around quite a few people. She was a witnesser. She had a joy to make known. So there's, there's an example for us all to love God no matter what we've gone through. To serve him with fastings and prayers. Don't have to take any of these legalistically. Do, do things joyfully as the Lord, as the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart. Don't put heavy burdens on yourself. But um, serve the Lord with gladness and speak to him. And uh, she spoke to those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. Now the word redemption, I again, I'm not a great Hebrew scholar. Um, I speak a bit of Hebrew and I was, we were in Jerusalem. We actually went to the Temple Institute, which is an institute in Jerusalem, preparing garments and articles for the rebuilding of the temple. Fascinating place to be. If you ask me, is a temple going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem? I would say pass. I don't know. Uh, if I said there won't be, and there is one next week, then I'd look a bit red-faced. <laughs> and, uh, um, and if I said there will, well, there will be, and uh, you, we can be wrong on these things, and they're way beyond our ability to really grasp. There's, there's loads of ways of interpreting scriptures. But we were in the Temple Institute, and they played a... Uh, it was a Jewish temple uh, institute, not a not a Christian thing, and we were there, and they showed us around, and then they played a video recording of a rabbi in Hebrew with subtitles in English. Now, my, I could never have understood him without the subtitles, but I did understand when he said, we are building a temple. Our goal is to build a temple for redemption. I understood that. And the word redemption, I heard it clear in the Hebrew, Yeshua. Yeshua. So he basically said we we're building a temple for Jesus. But as a Jew, he didn't mean Jesus, he meant redemption. And I thought, oh, <laughs> thank you, Lord, for that double meaning. Uh, I, I don't think uh, God wants a temple for animal sacrifice, of that I'm pretty clear because the Bible makes that clear. But every temple should be for Yeshua. Amen. So that's that's uh, all I can share about Anna. Let's move on to the, 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 the event when Jesus was 12. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned on foot the 70 miles several days journey to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. Nazareth, a Hebrew word meaning a, um, an offshoot. The word Nazar is a Hebrew word, the offshoot of an olive tree. So there shall be an offshoot from Jesse's root. There will be a Nazarite. There'll be a Nazarite from Jesse's root. And the Bible says he shall be called a Nazarene. That's a very difficult prophecy to find in the Old Testament. But unless that you look in the Hebrew, he shall be a Nazarene. He'll be an offshoot of Jesse's stump. And Nazareth was probably named as a, an offshoot, a new place 
that was founded far from Judah. Probably there were a number there from Judah that wasn't from the tribe of Judah. Probably it was an offshoot, and that's why Nazareth, how Nazareth came to be. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. He grew physically and, in, and spiritually filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And wouldn't you love some examples of those, those little things that it says about Jesus? His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And this was the, the bar mitzvah for a boy is at the end of his 12th year. He becomes a man. And uh, if you ever go to Jerusalem um, and you go to that area, uh, the Jewish quarter where uh, the, the, the Jewish synagogue is, and you often see uh, celebrations around a bar mitzvah. A boy is brought in. Everybody's rejoicing, the family are there, they're shouting, and there's the joy of a, of a boy becoming a man at the age of 13. And uh, um, of course, the father is incredibly proud of his son. And this last year is a particular bonding time of mentoring. I don't know if it is now, but you, this was a very special time for Joseph to mentor his stepson and uh, he mentored him probably by showing him and commenting and maybe the family members too to this boy this oldest boy in the family brothers were there and sisters we know we know that the, the mary and joseph had children and here's the oldest boy jesus and he's being shown around Jerusalem, the temple, and then the Passover lamb, which they ate. And then the streets and the walls of the city, and they would point to various, all the hist history of, of Israel, so many things, and they would see the priests and maybe see the high priest, and what a wonderful time it was to be at the Passover in Joseph. Uh, taking time to mentor his stepson. Uh, and they were there according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, they must have uh, been a group, maybe some families together, and they grouped together and they said, well, we're leaving tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what time, I suppose they set off early. You can kind of try and imagine it. They, they agreed to, to leave. And so Jesus obviously knew this. He wasn't going to be disobedient. He wasn't disobeying. Um, but he, uh, it wasn't a command that was given to him. It was just telling them what they're going to do. And he thought, well, I think I'm not going to go with you on this journey. I'm going to stay. <laughs> and the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem. Now, a 12-year-old boy, lingering behind on his own. Uh, he, he, uh, I suppose some boys might be a bit scared. It's a strange city and uh, all the familiar friends, Joseph and Mary, everybody's gone, but you never find a whiff of fear in Jesus. He lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother didn't know it because the groups were big. And I guess the boys would be together and so on and and they didn't know that he had not come with them. But supposing him, let's use the word assuming him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey, a whole day. And they looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And I love that little word, they assume, they supposed. They supposed this would be like this. They supposed, and this is what I, I, I find fascinating, is that you can have a personal devotional life. You can have a, 
um, church prayer meeting and you can suppose that Jesus is there. You just assume he's there. So you just carry on as if he's there without actually looking for him. And then after a few days, you know, where's Jesus? We've had a prayer meeting. We've had a few weeks of prayer meetings, but we haven't felt his presence. I've had my devotional times, but I, I haven't sensed him. Where are you, Lord? What are you doing? And in our church programs, we can make a program and then assume, well, God will bless us. We've made our program, now we'll pray, God bless us, amen. That's an assumption, a presumption. But what, what God wants is, no, look, you are to put Jesus first. Don't lose him on your journey. Don't lose him in your devotional life. And there's a, a parallel to this in um, the Emmaus Road because they also lost Jesus. Of course, he died on the cross. And those two were um, walking away from Jerusalem and uh, they, 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 had, they didn't know, him, know where he was. And then he drew near and uh, they still didn't recognize him. Jesus can be right close to you, but you're not, you, he's not coming in the way you think. And we need to realize that Jesus is not, as C.S. Lewis puts it, a tame lion. <laughs> he's not a tame lion. And he will do things that will perplex us, as we will see in a moment. Mary was perplexed. When they didn't find him, they too, I assume just the two of them, left the party, left the children with the, the, the group and the family, the relatives and everything. They went to, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days of looking, they went all over Jerusalem. They went to the um, tourist shops. <laughs> they, I'm sure there were tourist shops, but not like today. But they, they went to, the, to all the places. They, 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 seeking him, they, after three days, they found him in the temple area. Not the holy places, because he wasn't allowed in those. But in the temple area, the large temple area, they found him sitting in the midst of the teachers, the, the lecturers, the doctors of the law, the, the educated, the great spiritual leaders. He was sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Oh, I wish those questions were recorded. <laughs> What did that boy say? And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And it, again, if you go to the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, as it used to be called, the Western Wall that you can still see today, the, uh, it's divided between men and women, uh, as it was then in those days, the Temple. Uh, area was divided between men and women. The men's side, particularly the men, I don't know why, not so much on the ladies' side, but the, on the men's side, there's groups of Jews with law arguing and talking and reasoning and talking about the law. There's a lot of teaching goes on around it. And here he was uh, in the temple area, in the midst of the teachers, and they were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they came over and interrupted the whole conversation. They were, they, they, his mother said to him, they were amazed and his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? There's a rebuke. Why have you done this to us? Look, your father, Joseph, Mary, among all the millions of earth, you know better than anybody else. Joseph isn't his father. 
Your father and I have sought you with anxiety. He said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And it's the first time we hear from the lips of Jesus and the first thing that he says openly like this and he calls God his father. My father's business. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And so you, you realize here that the, Joseph would have mentored his son. But actually, Jesus was being mentored by his true father. <laughs> so what, as, they went, as Jesus went around Jerusalem, and maybe Joseph was saying, look at this, this is the, the temple. And maybe in his spirit, he heard the father whisper, yes, it will be destroyed in, in, in about... 90 years time and and it will you will make it obsolete my son by your sacrifice and they ate the passover lamb and maybe the father whispered yes my son that's you and the temple area barred to jesus the father saying yes there's going to be a greater priesthood and I don't know what the, the father of Jesus uh, spoke to him uh, at different times, but I know that the father mentored Jesus, not Joseph. <laughs> I'm sure Joseph blessed him and God used Joseph a lot and all that, but the true father of, of Jesus, who could, or the only one who could mentor him, was the Father in heaven. And at this point you realize that the great difference between Jesus Christ and everybody else on the planet was that God was his Father. It doesn't say anywhere in the Old Testament, I can't think of anywhere in the Old Testament of anybody praying and saying Father to God. There are about four occasions when in the Old Testament, it says God is like a father to the nation of Israel. And that's true. There are qualities. He even says he's like a mother, uh, or greater than a mother. But it says it, 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 different things. But it, nobody, I can't think of a single moment when anybody ever said, Father. Why? Because he wasn't their father. This is the great new thing thing that Jesus is bringing. He's come to bring many sons to glory. But when you think of Jesus, I, what I love about this, this whole story, um, this event, um, is that it reveals to us that Jesus knew his father very clearly at the age of 12. Now, I, I don't know at what point um, Jesus uh, consciously knew things. But what I do know is that Jesus knew things unconsciously before he knew them consciously. And that is true of every Christian. That is true of every Christian. If you surrender your life to God and, you have, and Christ is in you, your life is not built by education. A Christian doesn't become a deep Christian by being educated as a Christian. He be, we, be, we, we become deep people by what God has done in our hearts and that then is released through our understanding. In other words, I could put it this way, you are more than you know. If you've received Christ into your life, you are more than you know. And the Bible isn't leading you through teaching to make you something. That's probably what 
other religions do and they try and get you to do follow laws and that's what the old testament did to try and follow this law and follow that. but the new testament is to plant a seed a person a presence in you and that person that's what you must become i like to put it this way if if um you know the story of the jungle book and mowgli and he grew up among the wolves uh, and, and then one day he met a, a human being and he was brought out of it and then he he was he was said you are not an animal you're not a wolf you're a human being i don't know which is worse by the way <laughs> in human terms but um you are not what you were you are not that person you are not that person with that sinful habit you are not a slave anymore and that isn't because we're teaching you to get willpower to overcome sin no we're saying to you there is one in you who is greater than than sin greater than the flesh greater than the world and you have one in and if you will listen and, and, and obey the promptings if you will let God the Father be your mentor he will tell you things about you that will astonish you I think when Jesus first heard the Father whisper in his heart you will um, uh, you will be the, the sacrifice that takes away sin I don't know what age he was um, I know that Jesus I, I'm confident I don't know this for sure I'm just like speculation but in my my heart, I think that Jesus had a uh, probably a, a, a quite a, a wonderful childhood, not a heavy childhood. I don't think when he was three, God said, "You're going to die for the sins of the world." And he go, "Oh," and he went around looking heavy and thing. I don't think that's that's how it happened. I think Jesus Christ grew up, and I don't know. I don't think this ever stopped in one sense. I think he never stopped being a child. In fact, it says in um, uh, Acts chapter 3, in the name of your holy child, Jesus. That's in the resurrection and the ascension and the glorification. In the name of your holy child, Jesus. And there's something about the childhood. And when we... When we look at Luke, always remember we're looking at Jesus in, in a number of ways. One is to look at him because he's come to bring God to be manifest. He's come to bring God manifest in human form. But he's also come to show you how you will be as a Christian. This isn't just Jesus, it's also you. Now, of course, we are. there's a huge difference between us and Jesus. We will never be Jesus. We will never be God. Of course not. But he has come to be, to show us what he wants to make us. And of course, when, when we look at this, God wants you to have a childhood in the spirit. He, if, I, if you ask me, what did Jesus know as a child? I'll tell you what he knew. He, he, deep in his spirit, as a baby, before he could speak, there was a great cry in his heart that said, Abba, Father. And when that cry is in you, the Bible says, the witness of the Holy Spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. Something in you says, you're my father. And it, of course, I, I don't like the word father as a translation because it sounds like a Victorian boy coming home from his boarding school and saying, Father. <laughs> Jesus didn't wasn't a Victorian boy coming home from boarding school saying father he was saying papa dad daddy you can find the best word you you would use I don't know which one you would use it's hard isn't it to find a good translation of Abba it's not easy but it's intimate it's loving it's 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 this word that you use and uh um, I remember a missionary who adopted a, um, a, 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 a baby, uh, sorry, an adult child. He adopted this adult child and uh, the, the girl 
um, wouldn't call him dad. She never called him dad. Well, for a long time, she never, she wouldn't call him dad. And it grieved him. He wanted to hear that, that word. She was, she was locked up and there was lots of hurt. And uh, then one day, she, um, she, uh, her shoe broke and it was damaged. And she came into the house and she said, Dad, my shoe's broke. Can you help me? Now, she, she was just asking for the shoe. But when she said, Dad, because he didn't make anything of it, he just got on with, with tears in his eyes and the wonder. And apparently, he said, I'd have bought her a hundred shoe shops if I had the money. <laughs> because it's this, God is waiting to be called Father. You find your own word that com you're comfortable with, but he calls you son. And it says in, um, when he brings the first begotten into the world, this is in Hebrews chapter one, he, um, this is Hebrews chapter one, he says, um, I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. You are my son. Uh, today I have begotten you. So when Jesus was a little baby, um, even in the womb before he was born, he could hear that word, you're my son. This is deeper than education. This is deeper than intellect. This is spirit, deep to deep. That's what Christians are, deep to deep. And that's why you have to open your deeps. If you've never done it, you've not understood what Christianity is. I can't make you a Christian by teaching you Christian theology. And you might have got Christian Christianity in your head and in your life invading you from the outside in. But actually you become a Christian only at the point at which you open your deeps to God. There are things about you. Some of them are dark places. Because we are not just mind and body. We are spirit. There are things about us that are instinct. I love the power of instinct in this sense that, uh, uh, you know, when I look at nature and I see, and I see um, these salmon crossing the Atlantic and going up these rivers or uh, birds flying back to their, the place where they were hatched and something oh well, I don't know you can you know more than me I don't know but the, the power of the the world is governed by things that are not taught those birds never got a book out saying well which way let me teach you where to go migrate they didn't do that but there's the same about you and me we have a migrating instinct in our heart it says in uh, I think it's Isaiah he says the stork knows its way and the the donkey knows its stall, but my people, my people, they've gone against this deep thirst instinct to know God. Oh, time's gone. Look at that. That clock just goes so fast. I'm going to have to change the batteries in that clock. But it's got two. You just put one in. Um, um, so we've, we've, we have to finish now. Uh, I won't have to finish this, but the point is that, let me, let me just say this, the point is, and just a couple of more minutes, there's Jesus with this deep, deep, and when I say deep, I'm not talking about, oh, complicated, I'm talking about the, the fundamental, that's what we are, and that's why what you have to do is let Jesus into your deeps, but once Jesus is in your deeps, you have to calm your soul. This is what the child Jesus did, his quiet years, his, his unknown years. What was he doing? He was learning the one thing that the world needs. You know, this is, a, we'll make an astonishing statement. I don't know if you think it's astonishing and if you'll agree with it. But the one thing the world needs is somebody who has Christ in them 
and a quiet soul to hear him. Most Christianity is like a Clapham Junction. Who are running around trying to find which platform we're supposed to be on. But Jesus knew his father. And he knew that the one thing the world needs is a person with a quiet enough soul to hear God. And I'm not talking about getting prophecies. There are prophets and there are false prophets and there are cuckoos and there are all kinds of things and there are true prophets, thank God. But just because somebody says, thus says the Lord, doesn't mean it's the Lord. I'm not talking about prophets. I'm talking about this deep Abba, Father. And the voice that comes like, you're my child. You have a destiny. And, and I'm going to quote a, a great um, hymn, but you, you see here, the silent years of Jesus were really the years of the personal discovery of his heavenly Father. And my usefulness in this world is, in, is, in, is really, fundamentally, in the end, in relationship to that. The inner witness, Abba, was his life, the delight of sonship, the security of love, being loved. The discovery of a place of the fine and authority. Mum and Dad, Joseph and Mary, didn't you know that there's a greater authority in my life that you must not intrude on? He wasn't saying it like that, wagging his finger like I was. But it was true. He was saying, didn't you know? That there's something greater in my and should be in yours, mum and dad. You're not the final authority. Of course, he submitted to them. Because that was what his father told him to do. The inner calm, the peace. I think the reason he was reasoning with those doctors of the law and everything and astounding them was because. He was drawing not just words, but a presence and a purity and a freshness and a loveliness. Through his words would come the, the oh, God is amazing. They weren't just saying, well, that was a clever insight. I never saw that Goliath meant that. Oh, I never saw that. that oh, that was clever. Oh, I never saw that one. No, they would think, oh. How beautiful is God. Let me quote the hymn and then we'll finish. I don't know if we'll sing it. But this is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Let me. O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love, that's Jesus in the temple. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. Who wrote that? They got to the heart of it. They knew God. And I come back to this, Jesus could have given us the secret of aerodynamics. He could have given to us E equals MC squared. Actually, E, e equals MC squared is probably peanuts to, to God because he did something far, far greater. 
That's probably like Lego to God. <laughs> you know, that what God could give us, the secrets of um, antibiotics, the secrets of surgery, the, the secrets of medical oh, oh, physics, and he could have composed um, symphonies better than, far better than Beethoven. But the thing, the thing is, all the things he could have given us, poetry, books, literature, what did he give us? The one thing the world is parched for. The person who knows God. If you know somebody who knows God deeply, it's rare. Thank God we all know him. But may you get thirst to follow the witness. I've gone over time, I'm so sorry. Let's, um, let's pray, shall we? Jesus, you are amazing and you show us what to do. Your hidden years, oh Jesus, and there you are, walking with the Father at 12 years old. Oh, Father, I, I thank you for Jesus. And I thank you that you're my Father too. You're our Father. Oh, Lord, as we sit before you just for this moment, I pray if anyone's here, let them open their deeps to you. Go and open your deeps to God. Bless us, Lord. Teach us ways of quietness, to hear you, obey you, enthrone you, love you, be taught by you, even if it's something that goes against the grain of all the world and all philosophy and science and education. We want to follow the ways of eternal love revealed in Jesus.